Hey everybody, Alan Noon here, and uh, today we're going to talk about loading screens and a little bit about streaming levels, seamless travel, so on and so forth. Um, so to set the stage a little bit here, when we're talking about working with maps and worlds and levels, uh, we do what's called traveling. And there's a couple different methods of traveling. There's seamless traveling and non-seamless traveling. And so I want to kind of set some expectations for what we're going to do today. We'll discuss seamless and non-seamless travel, and then we're going to do a demonstration of uh, some streaming levels in behind loading screens and, and some other stuff. We have kind of a fun little project here today, so uh, there's some other goodies we can get into as we go. But uh, let's start with non-seamless travel. So non-seamless travel occurs in a multiplayer game when you, uh, there's typically three conditions. When you're first starting the game up and loading the map for the, uh, the initial time, uh, when you're connecting to the server for the first time, and then also when you're finishing a game and going to start a new one. Um, now, creating a loading screen in these situations is the more tricky and challenging one, as some of you have uh, voiced on the forums there. So that's a bit beyond the scope of what we're going to really demonstrate today. But uh, we do have some good news on that front, so we'll get to that in a second, and um, we can address that. So uh, really quickly, um, non-seamless travel occurs, what we typically refer to that as, as a, uh, a hard load. So in this situation, all of the resources of the machine are devoted to loading up content. And uh, that all the processing power is devoted to you know, getting the game up and running, loading in maps, so on and so forth. And so you'll typically find this behavior to be chunky, right? So we've all seen in games, as their loading screens come up, they've got their little icon spinning in the corner. And as the data comes in, you can kind of hear the drive churning, and maybe that icon sort of hitches for a moment, so on and so forth. Uh, this is fairly typical of a lot of games, and it's not necessarily a UE4 specific issue, if you want to call it an issue. Um, the reason that we see those sorts of things is that, again, all the processing power is devoted to getting that content in. And we don't really know the size of the content, how much content is actually coming in, and so everything is sort of churning away. Um, we do this in Paragon at the very beginning of the game. We do the one hard load, and then we transition into seamless travel. So when you first start up, we do the hard load. We're loading everything in, all the UI, the initial map. And then as we pick our characters and move into the team assembly screen, I'll call it, I suppose, or the team select screen, from there, we start loading in the background via seamless travel. As we transition to the next map, we are transitioning to a temporary map. That's called the transition map. And this is set up in your project settings. You can access that through here. Let's switch over and actually show. We've got a project here. We're not going to be doing this today, but I'll just show you where to find it. So in maps and modes, if we click down here, uh, you can see that we can set up a transition map. So you can go ahead and author a transition map that you specifically want to migrate your player controllers to. If you don't, then one will be created for you automatically. OK. So um, let's talk about, so a couple of issues came up, a couple of questions on the forums when we announced this topic for today. and. Um, for lack of a better point at which to address it, I'll just do that now. Let's talk about progress bars. So there was a question of how to do uh, sort of chunkless or smooth loading, how to do a progress bar that smoothly loads up. Again, this is pretty problematic and challenging because, again, we don't really know how much data is coming in, the size of the data, the volume of the data, so on and so forth. And so as typical, as mentioned previously, with many other games, you'll see that sort of um, segmented loading bar come on in. Uh, there are ways to get around this. They involve some amount of work. If that is really, really important to you, then I do have a reference that I can provide. Um, so one of my Twitter friends, One Man Wolfpack, sorry, I don't know your actual name there, uh, provided this really great blog post. Let's blow this up about memory, ma memory management in UE4. And uh, they go into detail how they went down this path of actually debugging what's being loaded in, when and how, and how they got their loading times down. So this is a really great reference. Let's go back up. Uh, let's see. We'll 
head down here. Uh, if you're really interested in doing the nice smooth loading bar, I would take a look at some of this information here and perhaps that can help you on your way. Now, I don't want to dissuade anyone from trying to achieve that perfectly smooth loading bar, but uh, personally, I think there are probably bigger battles to fight, so uh, I think that's why you see a lot of games going with the sort of rotating or spinning icon, so that uh, you know not a lot of cycles are wasted on that effort. Okay, um, so yeah, again, seamless, non-seamless travel, loading screens involved with those are a bit challenging. There's a couple more references I want to provide. So Nick Darnell here at Epic has been working on a new plugin. So I want to show you that. You can go to GitHub and mess around with it. This is sort of a little side project he's been working on for a little while, and uh, I know he wants to devote more time. But uh, you can go ahead and get this plugin and uh, plug it right into your game. He has some documentation here as to how it works. But definitely take a look at that. So. The good news that I mentioned previously is this, that uh, work is being done, and uh, hopefully we'll see some good news on this front soon. And then similarly, Mr. James Baxter has a similar sort of tutorial here that he's put together. It is a C++ solution, but he provides all the code there so you can copy and paste it in. Really great tutorial here. So you can take a look at that if... Uh, if achieving this more challenging type of loading screen is what you're looking to do. Okay, so uh, let's take a quick look at what we're going to do here. So we're going to actually do the easy kind of loading screen. We've got our world. Let's take a look at this project here. We've got a bunch of rooms and doorways and portals in between each room here. Now each one of these is actually a different map. Let's go ahead and look at our maps. And we'll blow this up. So they're very simply labeled. We have a grid system. Each one of these corresponds to a room on the map here. And they are all set. If we go ahead and open up our Levels browser, you can see here we have our... I don't want to dock that, actually. I just want to blow it up a little bit. So we have our persist persistent level, and then we have all of our rooms underneath. So you notice this blue dot here. That indicates that the majority of these rooms are set to stream in using a Blueprint call. So if you right-click one of these, we could change the streaming method to Blueprint or Always Loaded. For the sake of this demo, we only have room C5, our starting room, set to Always Loaded. Uh, the other level in here is what I call the design level. And I'm going to go ahead and move this over. I kind of like to have it stored in this pane so that we can actually kind of see what's going on here. So persistent level, this will probably take a second. So only a couple of things in the persistent level. You can see the lighting and everything goes away. We've got our atmosphere, skylight, directional light in there the rooms I previously mentioned, and then this design level down here holds all of the doors and then the system for actually transitioning between the rooms. So you can see here, these are actually blueprint actors that have some information embedded in them. They tell us the room number and where we're going to be heading to and from. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what this looks like if we actually run it. So we've got our little room here. Let's head through this door. Door opens up. We'll move through, we get our loading screen. Once the room's loaded in, we transition on in. Now, yes, these rooms are very, very, these maps are very, very small, not really anything in them too much. So we do have a little bit of an artificial delay so that we can actually see what's going on. Otherwise, this would pretty much instantly disappear. All righty. So let's take a look at how this kind of works. So within our design level, you see we have these doors. These are blueprint actors, blueprint classes. And uh, we've got some labels there. We've got the B direction and the A direction. I set up a, uh, a convention that the A direction faces north, B south. And then when they're on the side walls here, A faces west and B east. And if we take a look at these guys a little bit closer, all right. 
So we've got a few different static meshes. These are doors here. There's no collision on the actual doors themselves. We've got this blocking volume here. This is what prevents the player from actually walking through. And then we've got two other trigger volumes. We've got the B side and the A side. And basically, we can set those to whether or not the, uh, the door is locked or unlocked from either direction. Let's go back to our level here. So if we take a look, we've got one selected in the details panel. First of all, we can set whether there are doors or not, uh, and then whether or not the door is locked. So the other data that we have here is whether or not the room is north-south facing or east or west. And then uh, we also have the level data that uh, provides us the information of which direction we're traveling here. So basically, this is a reference to these guys down here on the floor. All right. And then uh, let's see. Uh, we, we can ignore these. This is just fine-tuning stuff. I was able to sort of pitch and roll the doors a little bit to get them to align properly. And then finally, uh, we're also specifying the levels that we're going to be loading in and out. So the player walks up. If the door is unlocked, then we go ahead and remove the blocking volume. And then as the player transitions in, we actually take control of the player and drive him into the middle of the volume here. And you can see we have this other little uh, collision sphere. And this is the trigger that actually uh, fires off the loading of the next room and then the uh, camera transition. So let's take a look at some of this on the graph level. OK, as I stated, Basically, here's the overlapping of those lock volumes. And we do a bunch of tests, whether or not we're open or not. We figure out where we're going. And we've got our actual timeline, drives the player through, and also drives the, uh, the camera position. We're going to go ahead and recreate some of this in a moment. But just to kind of give you an idea of how that works, yeah, this is the actual transition to the new room when we hit that sphere in the middle. So let's go ahead and just take a look at that again. Ta-da! And that's just a simple piece of UMG that we're going to recreate. So I'm going to jump over to a clean version of this project, and uh, we'll get started recreating that. All right, I can see some questions filtering in. While this is loading up, let's take a look at that. OK, how can you tell if your games have finished loading most or all the assets and know when to stop the spinning thing? OK, we can cover that in a moment. And let's see, what else do we have? Uh, the other question here is, did slash do you experience any sort of reset on the reference setting of your actors, which are placed in the level? Uh, for example, references being cleared whenever. OK, yeah, we can talk about that as well. So uh, in this particular case, no, because I'm streaming right in or out. Now, previously I should have mentioned this when we're talking about the uh, seamless and non-seamless travel. So yeah, as you are um, transitioning from map to map in the uh, seamless travel, then yes, you would lose your references because basically um, an entire new world is being, uh, and potentially game type is being loaded in. So what you'd want to do there is set up a custom game instance, and any values or properties that are important to you, uh, you're going to want to push up to the game instance, and then as you load in the new world, you're going to bring them back down uh, as you're ready to play the game. So for example, if you have a character with um, some certain stats that they've accumulated over the course of many games, perhaps their damage, is increased, their, uh, or health, health value, something like that. That would be something that you push up to the game instance, load in your new world, and then bring it back down so that when they start the gameplay, they have access to those expanded attributes. All right, and let's see. I loaded up the wrong project, so we're going to go ahead and load up the clean version. Just a moment. OK, here we go. So this should look fairly similar. But if we go ahead and hit play, we'll run through the door, opens up, fall through, and off into the void. There he goes. All right, so we will want to stream in this next level, C4. And th all of this really happens in the door, as mentioned previously. So let's go ahead and we'll edit the door here. And we're going to have this occur 
during the transition to the new room. So the first thing that happens is we get the player character and we disable his input. So as he hits that value, we kind of lock him into place. And then we determine whether or not they're transitioning to the new room. This is just a simple Boolean that we're setting. And then uh, we're getting the actual game instance because uh, typically what I like to do is um, any sort of uh, classes or properties that I want to have access to anywhere in the game, I'll typically push those up to the game instance. So what I'm doing is I'm getting this class called the game manager. And let's go ahead and take a look at this. This is one of our blueprints here. And where is our stream game manager? This is him. So basically, what this is, is let's turn that off. That is not useful for us today. And he should be hidden, but he's not. OK, great. Anyway, uh, so what he is is uh, basically the camera. And then he's got a little target here. And he's got some logic for whether or not we're hiding that mask. And we're getting a bunch of information as to where we are in the world, where we're going to be heading, all that other good stuff. So the doors and the, the game manager basically uh, do the heavy lifting of this project. So we're getting the location of that game manager. And then via a timeline, we're driving it to the new position, this destination current. Again, that is set by the door up here. So again, we have a variable where we're setting where we're coming from, where we're going to, depending on which direction we're traveling through the door, setting that as the destination current, and then driving that through. Uh, so this is the game manager that's being set to the new position, and then we're actually moving the character through the door. If we double click that, you can see here we're getting the door direction, whether or not we're moving north, south, east, west. And we got a bunch of information here to determine which direction that should be going, and uh, adding some movement input, driving that via a timeline. So that's how the guy actually walks through. So this is a very old school type of thing. The player is not actually manually driving the character through. We take control, push him through, and then once he's in his location, we shut the doors, and then we give control back right here. OK. Alrighty, so uh, this is where we actually want to uh, take control and insert the streaming of the level. So let's go ahead and make some real estate. And I think the first thing we'll want to do is pop up our widget. So we'll have to create one of those. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new user interface widget. And we'll call this our loading screen. Uh, widget. This is going to be super, super simple. I'm just going to throw up an image back here. And we'll just lock that to the center of the screen. And I'll just have it fill the screen. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. I could probably numerically type this in, but whatever. All right, we'll, just, we'll pick some other color. There we go. All right, and we'll put another image in here. Anywhere is good. Let's move this up. So in our textures folder, I've got a few textures here. Let's take a look at this. So this is basically our loading message. We could use text if we wanted to. And we also have the actual uh, period as an image. And I figured that was just the easiest way to go ahead and do that sort of progression there of animating the thing. So let's get our loading screen widget. And we'll take a look at our brush. Drop that in there. All right, and we need another image. And we'll take our period right there. All right, I won't make this pixel perfect in the interest of time, but there we go. All right, I am going to label this, though. Uh, 
Yeah, come on. Like so. And we'll paste a couple more in there. Great. And let's see if we can move him around. Oh, he probably pasted way up in the corner, didn't he? Yep. All right, good enough for us. Okay, um, let's go ahead and uh, create some animations. So I'm going to make a new animation, and I'll just call this uh, the loading animation. And we're going to add dot zero and color and opacity. And initially, he'll start out with uh, zero there. And maybe over the course of, uh, let's say, half a second, he'll increase his opacity. All right, and we'll do the same for the other dots. I'm going to give myself a little more room. So back at zero frame. And at one second, we'll be at full opacity. We don't want that in there. OK, that's better. And we'll add the third dot. Color and opacity again. Starts at zero, and about there, we'll go ahead and set that at one. OK, cool. So you can see they kind of fade in, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and change these types here. Let's go ahead and make that stepped. Oops. Okay, so now with any luck, they should just blink in. Sweet. All right, I'm going to go ahead and control S, save all that, compile it. So I think that's probably good for our widget. Let's go back to our door. And uh, we could really do this any place, but um, let's go ahead and get the controller. We're going to get the player controller. And I have a custom player controller set up over in our blueprint section here, uh, which would be right there. So we want to cast to that. So stream player controller is our controller. And we're going to go ahead and create a widget. Let's zoom in. And that is our loading screen widget. And I typically will go ahead and promote this to a variable so that I can easily refer to it elsewhere in the graph. And we'll add that to the viewport. OK, so if we hook this up, what happens next? We determine whether or not we're transitioning. We say yes. Uh, we're getting the game instance. OK, over here in the game manager, this is where we start actually moving the camera into the next room. So somewhere right around here, 
I guess this is probably a fine place to do it right after we pop that widget up on the screen is where we actually want to load in our level. Whoa, hey. We're way out there now. So um, we are coming from level A. We need sort of a, um, let's go ahead and figure out where we're actually coming from. So I'm going to make, let's uh, open a streaming level. Uh, let's see. Load streaming level, that's what we want. But I want to be able to change which level we're loading based on which direction we're coming from. So I'm going to go ahead and promote this to a variable. And I'll just call this uh, level to load. All right, so we need to figure out what level we are going to load. That We're going to take care of that up here at the top. So right over here is where we're figuring out the camera destination, that game manager. So this looks like a good place to do this as well. So let's select this bit. And we'll move that over. Could probably keep you closer to your branch. OK. And we're going to set that here. And I'm going to copy and paste. So these two branches that I'm working from, uh, depending on which lock trigger we interact with, it will set the destination level accordingly. So let's pop that in there. And we'll say level to load from direction A. And level to load from direction B. And we'll go ahead and hook that back up. All right, so back here. So now, by the time we've hit that transition sphere in the middle, that spherical trigger, we should know which level we actually want to load. So let's go ahead and wire this back up. Now oh, that is really far out there. Let's pull that back in a bit. OK, so once that level is loaded, then we actually want to go ahead and get rid of the widget that we put up there. So we'll take our widget reference. And we will uh, remove from parent. All right, with any luck, that should work. OK, we open the door. There's our level. No, our level's not there. What's happened? So let's see. We're loading our stream level. That's our level to load. Something must have gone awry over here. Level load from A. So that should be set by the time we hit that doorway. What have I missed? Actually, do I want these reversed? I'm probably, let's try this. Actually, we're not even uh, firing off our, something has failed further down the chain. So we've got our player controller. That's our loading screen. Uh, uh, let's see, there we go. Just for fun, let's see here. We should have the proper player controller assigned, but let's just double check. Hmm, why are you not working? We're not even getting to that point there. Let's see. I'm going to jump back to my other project really quick. See where I've run afoul. OK.
All right. So player controller, we cast to our specialized player controller. We're creating the widget. We're adding it. We've added it to the viewport. We've got our level. Aha, maybe that little guy right there is the issue. Let's jump back. Yep, that little checkbox there. I'm going to guess that's the issue. Although we didn't create our widget, so something else I think is happening here. Yeah. Let's go check our work. All right, that's where we remove that. Let's make sure we got this correct. Yeah, that should be fine. OK, not sure what I've missed. It should be pretty straightforward. OK, well, good thing we had a little uh, prep ahead of time. So um, we got our streaming level loading in. I put in an artificial delay so that we could see the actual loading screen. And then we removed that widget. And then again, we transitioned through. I did add a little extra piece at the end here on finished. Once we've moved the character through the door, we delay for a moment, and then uh, we've actually unloaded the streaming level because I created a new variable called level to unload. And similarly, as we go through the door, basically we figure out which, when we're coming through the A trigger, figure out which level we want to load and which level we want to unload, and uh, conversely on the other end. So actually we can see this in action here. If we zoom out a little bit, you can see that we don't have the other room up ahead of us. And as we run through, we hit our loading screen. Our level is loaded. We step in. We have a little pause. And then we're unloading the prior level. All right, I'll have to go back and figure out what has gone wrong there, because that all looked like it should have worked just fine. All right, so um, the other thing I wanted to show is not only can you throw up a simple piece of UMG, but you can actually load behind a level sequence. So let's look at that. Close this down. All right, so if we take a look over here at the origin, you can see I've got a level sequence here. And that is actually part of our persistent level. We can open him up. If we go to cinematics, sequences, and take a look at our master sequence. And this is very simply just three quick, simple cuts, not particularly arty or anything like that. But if we go ahead and play it, we simply pan across, then we pan up, and then we do some uh, depth of field stuff. So this is going to look very similar to the door example with the UMG. Again, we'll open that up. And I just need to hook this up right here. So instead of creating the widget and adding that to the screen, what we're doing is creating a level sequence player. And this is that master sequence that we just took a look at a moment ago. We're going to set it to play looping. And then we've got the uh, level that we're going to load. We load it in. Now, I put in a delay so that we could actually watch the cinematic. And then all the way down here, uh, once the level has been loaded, we go ahead and we stop the level sequence. And if I go ahead and compile this, that should go away. And we're actually setting the view target with blend. So we're actually taking control of the camera attached to the game manager here. We're taking that back over after we're, we are done playing the level sequence. And all of this is the same. We move the character through the door, and we do a delay, and we unload the stream level. I'll get to this in a second, but let's take a look at how this works. So we hit play. So we've already loaded the other level back there. You can see like it pretty much happens instantaneously because it's such a small level. So let's go ahead and drop a little delay in there so we can see it happening. Just to ensure you that, or assure you, assure you, excuse me, 
that uh, you can load behind a level sequence. So probably, let's see. We actually load our level here. So let's kind of pull that over. I'm going to drop a delay in there. Maybe of like two or three seconds. So now what we should see is the cinematic will fire off. The actual room next door won't be there immediately. You can see we're looking off into the void again. And there it just loaded in. So again, just to demonstrate that you can load behind a level sequence. All right. Well, actually, let's let that finish out. Play it one more time. All right, we should do our depth of field, and I believe it should start playing again. And then it should kick out of it once our delays are done or our project is or our map is loaded, and then we do our transition. All right, so let's get back to this one little piece on the end here. Okay, so the question came up before, how do you determine whether or not your level is loaded? So there is a new node. Let's follow this pink line all the way back. If you recall, this is the actual level that we're trying to load. And just being sloppy, I made that humongous line all the way back. There's a new node called Get Streaming Level. And if you drag off of that, then you can figure out, is the level loaded? So we could potentially, if we had a larger level that took a few seconds to load, instead of having this delay here, we could do this test and say, yeah, the level's loaded, that's true. Okay, now we're going to unload the level behind us and, and so on. Uh, there's other good stuff in here, so let's take a look at, um, you know, we could see, should it be loaded, should it block on load, and then we have a bunch of event dispatchers, and there's our is level loaded that we were using previously. So very, very handy node right there that should uh, address that question. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to some of the questions here. All right, let's see. All right, so the question here is, since the game takes control of the player's pawn, should I care about other AI during that time? Uh, I guess whether or not you should care is up to the requirements of your game, but uh, you could basically uh, turn those, if you want them to wait, if you want your enemies in the next room to wait while you're transitioning in, you could basically uh, disable their tick and uh, then turn it back on once the player is in and sort of gain control again and reestablish himself in the world. All right, let's see what else we have here. How can you run a mode during the loading process that's like playing Namco's mini games when waiting? Ah, that's a good one. So um, in that case, so we do have that transition map that we mentioned previously, and you can create a custom map. I don't see why you couldn't create a simple mini game there and actually play that potentially while everything else was loading in the background, because you are loading a new map with uh, potentially new game mode and uh, new player controller and all that other good stuff, or player controller type. Uh, another question about having a loading screen. Uh, is there any need of handling AI during that time? Uh, again, that's up to you and what kind of conditions you set on your AI. You know, Are they only active? When they're visible, are they only active you know, within a certain range, and so on and so forth? Uh, again, up to your project. And how do you create a 3D loading screen for VR? OK, so yeah, that question has come up a couple of times. Um, so I actually talked to a buddy that is doing VR development actively. And uh, the current solution that they are using is basically when you're going to load um, they teleport the player off to some tiny room in space, and that's full of you know whatever sort of uh, content they want to display during the loading screen. And then when it's done, they're basically teleporting the player back, you know, doing a fade up, so on and so forth. It's kind of an old school method, as he called it. Uh, there's nothing like super nice and handy right now. Uh, perhaps Nick Darnell's loading screen uh, plugin might be able to handle or deal with that at some point down the road. So yeah, let's see. I think those are the majority of questions here that I could probably answer. 
yeah, so um, that's largely it. Kind of a short stream today. Fun little project. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump through here one more time. And we should get control back. There we go. All righty. So, yep, that's it. If you have any further questions, then go ahead and post those on the forum, and we'll try to get those addressed. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much.